it's really good to be with you today in this um, strange way, but uh, one that I think we've got a bit more used to <laughs> coping with, haven't we? Uh, very sorry that we're not all able to meet in person, but thank you so much for deciding to join this session and giving a little bit of your time to this really important topic of how do we engage our churches with caring for the wider natural world that we all live within. I feel really privileged to have this bit of time to share with you and really, really privileged as well to be able to join in just in this little way in the life of you as a network with all of the, the amazing work and sacrificial work uh, that you are doing and the lives that you're living. So thank you so much for giving me this bit of time and, uh, and I hope we'll have some good time together. My name is Ruth Valerio and I live on the, down in the south of England with my family. And I'm one of the directors of the charity Tear Fund Tear Fund, I'm sure many of you will know, is a, a Christian global justice and development and advocacy organization. And we work alongside and with the local church in about 50 countries, working in some of the poorest communities in the world, helping to see people lifted out of poverty and living flourishing lives and discovering their God-given potential. It's a real, um, well, I've said privilege, I think three times now already, but <laughs> working with Tear Fund is fantastic and I love the work that I do. And we're here today to think through these wider issues of environmental care and how can we be bringing them into the lives that we live and the work that we're doing with our churches. I want us to start by thinking about a nine-year-old girl called Ella, and she died back in 2013. She's from Lewisham in London, and just a, a few months ago, the coroner, it's taken all this time for the coroner to rule what caused the, this little girl's death, but just a few months ago, the coroner made legal history by ruling that air pollution was a key cause of the death of this beautiful nine-year-old girl. Ella, as I said, lived in Lewisham and for all of her life, she was exposed to excessive air pollution that exceeded legal limits, exceeded both EU and UK, yeah, EU and UK levels. And so for all her life, she has been breathing in poison. And the coroner said that this was one of the key things that caused her asthma, which eventually then led to her death. It can be easy to think that issues of the environment and caring for the natural world is just a middle class thing and not something for people with lower incomes to, to bother with. Well, I want to challenge us if that's what we think and call us to think again, because the reality is that it is the economically poorer people who suffer the impacts of environmental breakdown. This is the case in the UK and I'm going to look at some of those issues. And it's the case globally as well. As at Tear Fund, we hear constantly, at every day we are hearing about the impact that environmental breakdown is having on the lives of people living in poverty and how environmental breakdown and the climate crisis in particular is devastating their lives. I think, for example, of a woman called Orbisa in the northeast region of Ethiopia. And climate change is having a devastating effect on her life. She and her family used to expect rain for up to four months, but now it only falls in August. And they are facing severe water shortage. 
she has to walk 10 hours every day in order to collect water from a lake. And even what she's able to collect then isn't enough for what she needs. Can you imagine the impact that that has on her ability to go out and, and earn a livelihood and to care for her family fully when she is having to walk 10 hours a day just to provide something as basic as water? Globally, we know that it is the poorest of the poor who are suffering the impacts of our environmental crisis. But that's the same in the UK as well. This isn't environmental breakdown isn't only a global issue that relates to people who live thousands of miles away. It is something that we are facing here in the UK and particularly in the poorest countries. I've been speaking about issues of poverty and the environment for, for some 25 years now. And all of that time, I've been living on, a, on an estate down here in the, the city that I live on, live in. Um, it's a, what would have been called a council estate, then now is a, called a social housing estate. And it's your, your classic white working class council estate, which has had all of the problems that you, that you would associate with some kind of, with that kind of area. And I've been living here for over 25 years now and working on the estate, working on the community, working in with the community, living here, part of the community, and also really involved in wider issues of poverty and global poverty and global environmental breakdown. And I can see just how much these things are linked. So I've, I have learned that you can't care for people without thinking about the land they live on and the air they breathe, uh, without thinking about the water that they drink or uh, use to, to wash themselves, ourselves. And you can't care for the wider natural world without thinking about the people who impact that world, whether through their extreme poverty or through their extreme wealth. So these things are intricately related. Poverty and environment go hand in hand. Poverty and environmental breakdown go hand in hand. And it's also true that issues of race and issues of gender also are very closely linked with these things. And sadly, environmental hazards follow race lines. So it's no surprising no surprise that those two examples of Ella, little nine-year-old Ella living here in the UK and Orbisa living in Ethiopia, both of them are women, both of them black. Poverty, environmental breakdown, race, gender, they are all interconnected um, and we need to be tackling and looking at these things together as, a, as an integrated whole. Environmental breakdown is something that we face here in the UK and that is really closely linked with poverty. So pollution is one of those really obvious areas and Ella's example um, just illustrates that. It is the poorest communities that tend to live, not tend to, it's the poorest communities that always live in the most polluted places. Another issue is energy. We know that big energy providers rip people off. It's more expensive to get your energy from a key meter than it is to get it through setting up a standing order. We know that people living in poverty in the UK are often facing, um, often facing energy problems and energy poverty. And this is at the same time where we're facing increasing unemployment. And there's actually a big opportunity to, to make a link here. We're facing a huge unemployment crisis at the same time as there being a desperate need for green jobs, which could tackle the climate crisis. We could tackle the climate crisis and unemployment together. So we're facing unemployment, we're facing energy, fuel, poverty, we're facing terrible pollution 
in our poor communities, we're also facing food deserts. We know that issues of obesity and issues of malnutrition impact those who are living in the poorest communities. And often, sometimes that's because of a lack of knowledge. Often it's because of wider issues of justice and a lack of access to places that sell fresh food at a price that is affordable. So food deserts is another issue for us in our poorer communities. And also access to green spaces. We know, and haven't we discovered it all the more so over this last year, we know that being connected with the wider natural world, being connected with green spaces is um, it plays a huge part in our sense of well-being and in mental health. And we know that those who are able to spend time outdoors and access good quality green spaces have higher levels of, mental, of well-being and lower levels of problems with mental health than, than others. And, but in our cities, often we're not able to access those good quality green spaces. And so there are a whole range of issues that link environment and poverty together. And I've learned that you can't separate those out. And if you are concerned for the poorest of the poor, then we will be wanting to respond to issues of environmental, to the issues of our environmental crisis. I've also learned and become increasingly convinced the more I've looked at these issues, that these aren't fringe issues for the church, but these are a fundamental part of what the gospel, the good news of Jesus is about. When we look right at the start in our Bibles, we see that we were created to be in relationship, to be in relationship with God, with each other through Adam and Eve, the creation of the human community. And we were created to be in relationship with the wider natural world. We have been created in God's image. I don't have the time to go into that in detail, but it basically means that we are God's representatives here to the wider natural world. We are the, the final species that has been created in order to look after the rest of what God has made. But the fall broke those relationships. And so the rest of the Bible really is the story of God working to put back to rights those broken relationships with God, with each other, and with the wider natural world. And Jesus came, Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, was all to put those relationships back to rights. Yes, absolutely, evangelism. Key to that is that we can have our relationship with God restored. But look at Galatians 3.28, Ephesians 2 and other places. The good news of Jesus, the gospel, is also that our relationship with other people can be restored. And then finally, Colossians 1.15 to 20, Jesus' blood was shed on the cross in order that all things on heaven and in earth, in heaven and on earth, might be restored, might be reconciled. That's a huge lot, a huge amount of biblical material I've just touched in a, in a very quick moment. If you want to read more about both the biblical and the practical, do get hold of both Ellis for Lifestyle and saying yes to life. There's so much biblical stuff there that needs unpacking further, and I haven't got the, the time to do that now. But it is simply to say that caring for the wider natural world is a key part, an integrated part of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as such, it's key to our evangelism. We are to reach out to people and invite them into God's story, into this whole good picture, this whole big picture of understanding the kingdom of God. Evangelism isn't about giving people um, a ticket to heaven, but it's about being part of the mission of God. 
of reconciliation, to see our relationships reconciled. And it's also key for young people too. We recently uh, released a report at Tear Fund showing that young people care desperately about climate change and yet they're not seeing their churches address that and that is impacting the faith of young people you can have a look more it's called burning down the house so have a look at that tear fund burning down the house and you'll see more about that report so then we see that environmental issues and poverty are completely linked this isn't a middle class preoccupation this is something for all of us wherever we are living to be grappling with because it impacts us all in the, in the communities where we are living and serving. And we see that this is a central part of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ and of what it means to be followers for, to, of him. So then what can we actually be doing in our churches? I want to finish by suggesting three things to you for us to think about. Firstly, let's bring these issues into our church life. Let's be talking about them. Let's talk about the, the environmental problems that we are facing in our churches. I did this in a, um, in a diocese in Tanzania, got their, uh, their church leaders together, uh, really facing severe poverty there and asked them to talk about what are the environmental problems that they're facing that are linked in with poverty and with the needs of their congregations. So many things there. Let's talk about, let's talk about fuel poverty. Let's talk about food deserts. Let's talk about access to green space. Let's talk about energy and, and pollution and unemployment, the need for green jobs. Let's talk about these things in our churches and help people see how they connect with our faith and how they connect with the scriptural, the biblical story. And then at a church level, there are all sorts of things that we can do to actually respond. And I would encourage you to think about those areas of pollution, fuel poverty, food deserts, unemployment and access to green spaces. There are so many different things that we can do to help respond. On the estate here that, that I live on, We've been involved in planting a community orchard and we've created some wildlife, some um, wildflower, wild meadow areas. We've worked hard at improving the green spaces and we've uh, together as a community, we have tackled some of these issues. There are other churches around the country doing likewise. And I'd really encourage you to have a look at Eco Church and see the practical stuff that is there. Um, in Haiti, it's not only happening in the UK, in Haiti is Tear Fund, we're supporting a brilliant couple in their church who are taking the water sachets that, um, that get used in countries like Haiti, it's not so, alongside water bottles, companies produce these little sachets of water and millions of them get thrown away, causing huge problems. They've created an ingenious way of recycling those into brilliant products that they're now selling and able to learn a living and earn a living from. With our food box schemes, uh, we can help food poverty. So many ideas. Let's bring these issues into our church lives. Let's look at the practical things that we can do at, at a, a church level as churches and as churches together. And then finally, we need to be speaking out about these issues, as well as taking practical action. Let's get involved in advocacy at a policy level. Help your church and its members to engage with policymakers, to engage with your local authority, to engage with your MP. Help them to speak out. It's what we've done on WIC. I've had to learn how to approach politicians and the local authority and um, there's been a whole number, I'm just looking out my window, I can see the estate, been a whole number of issues that we have tackled together as we've learned how to get a voice and to speak out and engage your, your church and your local MP on the global issues too. This is a really crucial year as we head towards UN climate change talks in Glasgow at the end of the year. 
And there, for us as our churches, I think it's a brilliant thing to do to be engaged with that so that we, so that as well as getting involved in our local issues, we also help our churches to lift our eyes and to see the global context and the global problems that we're facing too. And for us to be part of the worldwide body of Christ. So do get involved in that. If you go onto the Tear Fund website, you, you can just click on the campaigns thing and you'll see a link to that that will give you more resources. So I'm going to bring my time to an end now, but just want to remind us of where we have got to. These things are central to the Christian faith. Caring for the wider natural world is a key part of how we respond to the issues of poverty that we see in our own neighbourhoods and in our own churches. And there are practical ways by which we can get involved. So let's stop putting this on the edges, on the margins of our church life, and let's integrate this right into the centre of who we are as church. Not out of duty or responsibility, but out of a sense of love and worship for our creating, sustaining, redeeming, saving God, and for the love of the people who we serve. Thank you. Thank you for giving me your time. Thank you.